and uh, welcome everyone. I'm pleased to uh, be leading you today via our evening. And uh, so maybe for starters, I will make some introduction to our exhibition, uh, which is called Truth or Care. Uh, I prefer the English uh, name or title much better because, uh, um, yeah, it's just more fun than in Czech. The subtitle is How is Life for Children and Parents in Prague? And um, tonight we will hear a lecture by Edit Collective from London, uh, which takes place also uh, thanks to the collaboration with Future Architecture Platform, as uh, Irena mentioned. Um, and uh, we are here, like, thanks to Viper Gallery, who, who was uh, like inviting us to make the exhibition. And it's an um, in, independent gallery based in Karlin Prague. And uh, over the years, it has hosted uh, many exhibitions on contemporary topics uh, regarding architecture, art, or space in general. And the exhibition Truth or Care, How is Life for um, Children and Parents in Prague, has uh, addressed the topic and the needs of little kids up to, up to three years of age. And um, their parents in public space and uh, public or private institutions. And since I happen to be a member of the author collective, let me say a few words about our approach. Uh, we manage it to connect uh, interdiscipl interdisciplinary into a team of sociologists represented by Karina Hoření, architecture historian Klara Bruhová, illustrator Jakub Plachy and ar architects Arela Pečlova and myself. Uh, we started with a social, um, sociological survey addressing parents uh, living in Prague and managed to collect over 200 reactions on what they and their children like about Prague public, public space, what they are missing, what approaches they encounter, what barriers they struggle with. And besides obvious uh, physical qualities or failures, uh, today designing approach is very much aware of. We also came across much more delicate and suave details, such as maybe emotional struggles uh, when parents uh, feel unwelcome in certain places, different perception of time maybe, or mental or real division of space uh, of that for kids and parents and of that for others. And it's our great question how uh, to approach more inclusive methods of designing and use of space. And so now let me jump into the introduction of Edit Collective and today's lecture, Honey, I'm Home, and the following debate. Edit Collective uh, is today represented by Alberta Loritsen and Mariana Janovic. And uh, we will move uh, more towards the personal zone the interiors uh, of our household and how design influences the relations among household members, how it structures our way of life and vice versa. And so EDIT is a group of uh, women who work uh, collectively to challenge the biases and hierarchies embedded in the built environment. And uh, the Feminist Design Collective uh, believes in full social, economic and political equality for all and uses design uh, as a tool to support more equal interactions, both during the design process as, uh, and as the outcome of the finished project. Also, it is now presenting the exhibition, How We Live Now, Remaining Spaces with Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative at the Barbican Center in London, which is opened until December 23rd, uh, 2021 and maybe uh, also you uh, heard of it or read of, of it uh, in, the, in the Guardian, which resonated uh, very much here in the Czech Republic in the Architektky Collective, which is a woman architect collective. And uh, so just a, a last technical reminder uh, for the following discussion, you can either ask question via the Zoom chat, um, just type it in, uh, or via comments on YouTube for those who watch us uh, via the streaming. Or also, if you feel like it, you can simply raise your hand. It's the icon on the right down corner. And I will pass the virtual mic uh, onto you. 
So that's for introduction. And now let's give it up for Edit Collective. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you, Irena and uh, Elspeth, for um, this introduction and for having us here. Um, we're really honored and happy to be able to share this research with you. Um, and I'm going to share my screen now. All right. So um, without any further ado, um, we're going to present to you our uh, research project called Honey, I'm Home. Uh, and as Elspeth said, um, it focuses, it kind of stemmed from uh, research into domestic spaces. Uh, but today we are going to try and connect, and not, not only today, but we, we in general, we try to connect this uh, research also to public spaces and cities. Um, and we're going to try and show um, that the two are um, sort of interconnected. So how um, these gendered environments um, affect us today at um, domestic object and city scale as well. So we look at these um, scales, the city, the home, the room, as performance and as theatrical sets which have been written and designed under systems of patriarchy. So the ultimate performance uh, and the most obvious of gendered social constructs perhaps is the nuclear family and the nuclear uh, the family is a reproductive force of capitalist relations maintaining the dominance of masculinity, the naturalization of housework and conditioning children for a competitive labor market. However, when it comes to critiquing the nuclear family, the classic capitalist mantra of there is no alternative strikes again, insisting that this is natural and far from political. Of course, we know that this is far from the truth, uh, which we will trace here through a history of legislation and architecture during the rise of the cult of domesticity. Um, just a little disclaimer, we are mainly focusing on Britain and the West today. Um, whilst Britain had enormous influence on in other parts of the world through, coloni through colon colonialism, sorry, um, and American media also disseminates these Western-centric ideas worldwide, it is important to note that um, this is just a small sliver of research about domestic design. Different countries and cultures have developed on different trajectories. We don't want to perpetuate the idea that Western Europe is the center of any of this. As Britain became a colonial power, a new bourgeoisie emerged, seeking to distance themselves through new ideas of morality. Uh, the Victorian obsession with propriety and hygiene led to the passing of policies and manuals instructing society on how to live. The Public Health Act of 1875 initiated a new form of state control over housing design, sparking the rapid construction of a new typology, the bylaw house, or what we all recognize today in Britain as the Victorian Terrace House. They were intended for single families with a clear hierarchy. These houses can be read as a gender diagrams of intimacy and most importantly, control. The diagram begins with a clear division between the two halves of the ground floor, the public and the private spaces. Kitchens, for example, uh, were, the main, uh, were the domain of either servants or women and were originally placed far away from the dining room. This reflected notions of propriety in middle-class homes, and in Victorian times, this was further fueled by fear of smells and germs. Uh, the public spaces within the house, which are for dining, leisure, entertaining guests, formal family events, were considered the man's domain. The private spaces, which are for cooking, looking after children, and other domestic ta tasks, were in instead considered women's domain. From a public perspective, the house is ordered and clean. Corridors provide privacy and further hide movements around the house. 
They allow a passage between the served and serviced part of the home, which we have adopted as purely convenient. Upstairs, there is a large bedroom for the parents, the master bedroom, and a smaller, darker bedroom for children. This shows the typical separation of the members of the family and the underlying hierarchy between them. Then during the world wars, uh, domesticity and family life was further promoted through British propaganda, echoing the pronatalist ideology, which later led to the baby boom. Towards the end of the Second World War, the government commissioned a number of reports to prepare for peacetime reconstruction. They responded through concerns of how to design houses to promote motherhood itself, working alongside propaganda, reinstating the character of the housewife and promoting consumerism. Uh, Britain's first space standards issued by the Ministry of Housing in 1963 show a timetable of mealtimes of an average work working household. An example of the servitude expected of the housewife is obvious here. It shows when the husband and children are served, again, highlighting how separate the family is. Even the wife and husband are not scheduled to eat together. In fact, the wife isn't scheduled to eat at all. Culturally, housework and childcare has been transformed from a form of labor to the moral undertaking of women, with women being morally judged through the cleanliness of her house and her care for her children. The mother care work became enshrined in the collective consciousness as a labor of love. And it's a strategy used to detract from its essential economic value. The modern movement then worked under the guise of female emancipation from the tedious tasks of domestic labor. However, it contradicts itself by using the tools of modernity, those of efficiency and tailorism inspired by the production line itself to design spaces and machines for the new efficient wife. For example, the predecessor of the modern fitted kitchen, the Frankfurt Kitchen, designed by female architect Marguerite schutte lehotsky was specializing a diagram of actions and rituals, but through the most efficient and compact form. Designed through Taylor's time-based exercises, the Frankfurt Kitchen was reduced to a space that could allow only one actor and one very specific performance. By isolating domestic care to rituals performed individually in one single room, the design reinforced the role of a sole invisible caretaker of the home. The connection between gender biases and spatial standards shown, um, are shown here in Neufert Architects data published in the 30s. The guide was a tool intended for a systematic production of buildings embedded with problematic prescriptions of appropriate behavior. It went as far as suggesting very different relationship between body and object, depending on gender, standardizing with measurements, the actions and rituals connected to the home's furniture. The legacy of domestic engineers is an important yet contested one, as it operates within the boundaries of the patriarchal and capitalist systems. To quote Matrix Feminist Design Cooperative, the researchers asked, how can life with your hands in the sink be a little more pleasant, but not why do women spend so much time at the kitchen sink? Barbara Penner, um, who is a British academic, unpacks this legacy in her article, The Flexible Heart of the Home, where she shows efficiency studies involving housewives with disabilities in the 1950s. As she points out, it is undeniable that the mid-century studies accepted the heteronormative ideal of the nuclear family. The critique is also directed at the cult of productivity, where improvements for disabled homemakers were firmly situated in the 20th century notions of productive citizenship, which defined liberal belonging through the capacity for productive labor, as well as through the evident fruits of that labor wealth accumulation, home ownership, and consumerism. Whilst the call to accommodate non-standard bodies was really important and laid groundwork for contemporary discussions about accessibility and universal design, it is also important 
to revisit the ideas, especially around design for independence and productivity. Is there more merit in thinking about design for interdependence, where able-bodied and disabled users can live together better today? Also, just to say, Barbara Penner's um, actually an uh, American academic working in Britain. The design of homes was historically largely overlooked in architectural history. In Britain, one of the groups who addressed it was Feminist Design Cooperative Matrix. Making Space, Women and the Man-Made Environment is a book originally published in 1987 and written by Matrix members. In it, they write about women's relationships to buildings, educate readers on understanding architectural drawings and unpack and critique historical layouts of houses pointing out gender inequalities. Members of Matrix take interest in the mundanity of women's life and spatial issues that were overlooked in the architectural profession. They also undertook efforts to bring more women into the construction industry as they understood that as long as men design for women, the women will remain strangers in the man-made world. Even if laws against gender discrimination have advanced in the past decades, the spaces that were born from these spatial gendered standards haven't changed radically in most cases. The specific arrangement of furniture can dictate the rituals which reinforce the icon of the nuclear family. Whether it is the arrangement of the table with the father at one end, the mother serving dinner, and the children waiting at the table to be served, or the location of the double bed in the center of the bedroom, conceived for two people and representation of conjugal life, one could say that the rooms within the home have become over time a series of theatrical sets for gender performances. The repetition of mundane and stylized performative acts feeds into social constructs of gender difference. Gender, as Judith Butler argues, is performed rather than a set of innate male or female traits. These rituals are only possible if isolating one set from another and if the division between them is reinforced. This happens with an architecture of boundaries, walls, corridors and closed doors, but also through the naming of different rooms according to the rituals and objects which are meant to inhabit them. The domestic objects we use to perform the rituals prescribed from each of these rooms have now become props to our everyday performances. And it's through these objects that women began to be sold an aspirational lifestyle. By the early 20th century, many homes had their own individual supplies of gas and running water. And although it improved the living standards in many homes, this privatization of utilities introverted domestic labor, which was once performed collectively and confined it to the individual household. We have a history of shared kitchens, shared laundrettes and public bathhouses as proud civic monuments, which have, lost, which have been lost to the oven, the washing machine and the private bathroom. The rise of consumerism in the thirties, alongside the privatization of domestic utilities, collided at a critical point where our culture moved towards private domestic work. The tailor's tools of our homes, from the lawnmower to the microwave to the hoover, designed for solo users, under the capitalist assumption that housework is most efficient when performed individually. These objects were also aesthetically gendered, visualizing the sexual division of housework, as well as maximizing the consumerist capabilities of the nuclear family by identifying a single specific user. Uh, the time-saving cap capabilities of post-war gadgetry in particular uh, were sold as emancipatory to the housewife and even as devices which allow them to, on occasion, step into the roles traditionally performed by men. As um, Joel Sanders highlights in his work, um, Joel Sanders is um, an American architect and academic, um, and he writes about the electric ca carving knife which was originally marketed at women, but became adopted by men as a mechanical prosthesis to nurture the insecure ego of the new suburban husband. This is a prime example of the object's ability to so strongly symbolize, embody, and embed gender domestic roles. 
The most recent revolution in domestic technology comes in the form of the smart home. Advances in digital technology are now being applied to the home. And as with the time-saving domestic devices of the last century, are also sold as emancipatory to women. This technology, however, isn't put to use in rebalancing the division of labor in the home, but rather outsources the role of the solo caregiver. The common feature of smart home bots imitating humans replicates ideas of servitude in the home and the fact that they most often have female voices further cements the view of caregiving roles as female. Domestic technology in this century and the last, whether through creating tools for individual solitary use or its digital incarnation as a helpful female bot, is complicit in the patriarchal system of unpaid reproductive work that happens behind the scenes. Um, technology is often the guise under which domestic work gets outsourced. Um, so it would be either to the housewife or externally of the nuclear family. In our streamlined homes, where technology is supposed to make work disappear, the lack of space for domestic labor results in pushing it to the very margins of our spaces and consciousness. Coupled with chronic undervaluing of care work, this results in a global problem of exploitation, where wealthier countries hungry for growth import cheap labor from abroad. These domestic workers often earn very low wages and sometimes have to leave their families behind in their country of origin. Uh, Bassem Saad writes about Lebanon's five square meter maids rooms, which are symptomatic of not only gender, but also racial biases, as women of color are especially exploited in the global care work system. Um, sorry, I went too far. Um, but another example is um, Singapore, where hiring a domestic helper from abroad is a very popular, affor affordable choice for many families. Uh, and it's uh, partially due to the lack of sufficient parental leave policies. Some families end up putting up their maids in the windowless bomb shelter, as the Ministry of Manpower does not specify a window as minimum provision for safe living conditions. The cult of technology in the Western world created the illusion that domestic work can be hidden away and unnoticed or disappear entirely, creating wide implications and consequences that affect the entire society. The popularization of the automatic washing machine and tumble dryer meant that the sight of laundry drying outside became associated with lower class living as the, those people could not afford a tumble dryer. Uh, Diane Harris writes about these middle class suburban notions of propriety and class in her book, Little White Houses, how the post-war home created race in America. So the social rejection of seeing something as simple as laundry is firstly related to gender, washing clothes as domestic work, uh, and it has to be concealed from sight. Secondly, as Harris writes, class and race come into question when these gender-based assumptions influence the design of suburbia and cement communities. Finally, the mythology of technology is also contemporarily a very important issue in the light of climate emergency. Tumble dryers especially use excessive amounts of electrical energy, yet in many parts of the world, drying laundry outside is either frowned upon or simply forbidden by residents' associations or landlords. Low-tech solutions such as the washing pole built into the public housing buildings in Singapore in the 60s and 70s could offer a sustainable alternative to the energy hungry tumble dryer, whilst at the same time normalizing the view of care work outside the confines of the private home. India also has a different relationship to laundry. Traditionally, washing was done by men, washermen called Dobiwala, Dobi being the name of their caste group. 
today, this dynamic has changed and is now less racialized and has become a more social event. Laundry often takes place on a gat, which is a public flight of stairs that descends to a river or in step wells, with laundry proudly display, displayed as it dries on the steps. In Portugal, in a fishing village just outside of Porto, Afurada, communal laundry takes place in wash houses and public squares. Local washerwomen meet, talk and eat whilst washing the family laundry. The laundry is then taken towards the beach and hung on drying lines. The separation of home and workplace is a major form of gender segregation, which results from the industrial revolution. During the 19th century, the act of production, uh, so excluding reproduction, was removed from the home and men were the only ones considered eligible for care work, uh, sorry, for paid work. Therefore, predominantly masculine workspaces were created while the domestic spaces became feminine. Men's focus was producing objects that the house would adopt, showcase and use. The domestic space became the center of consumption. This had an impact on the master planning of cities where suburbs isolated women away from the busy city hub. The domestic community was far removed from the civic centers, factories and offices where important decisions were made, new inventions created and money was gained. The buildings in the suburb were designed to fit within the perfect image of domesticated landscape. This spatial separation between domestic and professional realms was proposed by the very influential Garden City movement. In it, the industrial and civic parts of the city were very clearly separate from the residential areas. This is also evident in the suburban regions in America, where sprawling suburbia were designed to be the domestic oasis away from the city center. They were also devised post-World War II for housewives to stay at home and make space on the job market for men coming back from war. Residents are often reliant on using cars to access amenities, which in practice is mainly the stay at home parents. Around the world, entire transport systems were designed for breadwinning commuters, bringing them from the suburbia to the city center. This means connections within and across suburbia required to run errands and take children to school are deprioritized, leaving homemakers isolated. And to this day, very little has changed. The private domestic space is still separated from the public office space, a key factor to the maintenance of capitalism. Whilst the COVID-19 pandemic made our professional and private worlds collide, it did not make things more equal for men and women. Research has shown that women bear the brunt of unpaid domestic work exacerbated by lockdown, and as a result, miss out on education and professional opportunities. One of our favorite terms in architecture is typology. Uh, specific spaces have specific functions. We dwell in the house, we research in the library, we work in the office, we educate in the school, and these offer very little variation. The repetition of these conventions create the space, the theatre, where human activity and specific actions are performed. This tailorism at a city scale, legally reinforced by zoning and land use policies, form barriers between social groups that are assigned to specific spaces. This is a political act which dictates who is meant to use which space and therefore who has influence in social systems. In the context of parenting, this is exemplified in the spatial separation of playgrounds in the city. Often fenced off for safety, they are the new type of public space children and parents get relegated to in a city designed for drivers. And it is alienating not only for children, but also for those parents, a result of planning that attempts to separate functions neatly. But the best things about living in the city are precisely those interactions between people of different ages, genders, backgrounds and occupations. In Britain, socialist historian and anarchist writer Colin Ward advocated for increased freedom and agency for children and young people in the city. 
In his influential book, The Child in the City, he wrote that rather than throwing in more playthings into the sandbox, we should help children climb out of the sandbox and into the city. Many workers consider the home as a retreat from paid labor and a place of leisure, but this isn't the case for many women. Globally, women do three times the amount of unpaid care work men do. So this corresponds to 75% of the world's unpaid care work. This can be subdivided into twice as much childcare and four times as much housework. And although care work is a necessity for our society, it's not perceived as a valuable activity. Gross domestic product or GDP is the global measure used to define a country's growth and thereby its success. In the UK alone, women's unpaid care work was estimated at one trillion pounds in 2016. And that number reaches $10 trillion when considering the annual global GDP. This work currently doesn't contribute to a country's GDP and therefore is further undermined in our current society. Professional care work is also chronically undervalued and underpaid. Development economist Jayati Ghosh explains the cycle of under, undervaluing this work. Women's work is considered to be worth very little, so then in turn occupations traditionally dominated by women, such as nursing, care work and housekeeping, pay low wages, creating a vicious circle. As a result, care workers of all genders earn low wages. These workers in turn are often the most marginalized in the labor market, such as migrant workers. There is an issue with what is considered as valuable in contemporary society. And as designers, we have the, the possibility to stop repeating the same scripts where productivity and reproductivity dictate the design of our spaces. Seeing the legislation uh, used to circumscribe our cities and homes as script and the spaces within them as sets. The domestic objects we use as props become a critical site for proposing disruptions to larger systems and the roles we perform within them. For our project Honey I'm Home, we developed a methodology for challenging and unlearning our most normative habits by making simple tweaks to traditional domestic spaces and objects. The modes of disruption we are experimenting with are altering scale, altering position in space, repetition of objects, change of user or number of users, change of materiality, and changing public to private or vice versa. The 2019 Oslo Architecture Triennale titled Enough, invited designers to rethink and resist our current cultural obsession with economic growth, which has landed us in a time of climate emergency and social division. As one of our most naturalized models of living together, the nuclear family and its home acts as a really good starting point when daydreaming about things like degrowth. We focused on the props which embody the division of reproductive labor most powerfully, and it's the cleaning devices. So for our project in the Triennale, we made some simple alterations to a very recognizable appliance to challenge current divisions of housework established by the nuclear family. Named the gross domestic product, uh, the um, it is a hoover that can only be operated when used by three people simultaneously. By altering the Hoover's design to make its individual use almost impossible, we want to challenge its current notions of domestic labor and explore its potential to be a collective, sociable, and political act. The GDP is an example of one scale that could be changed in order to start changing our entire culture around sharing and reproductive labor. In order to imagine how these small changes affect larger change, we have set the Hoover within a fictional narrative, claiming that it was an idea founded in 1919, uh, which is the time when the original domestic Hoover took its current form. We ask for people to imagine how differently we could be living had we followed an alternative trajectory. In a world where time is money, saying no to productivity as the most important measure becomes in itself an act of resistance. 
So as an alternative to the capitalist assumption that housework is most efficient when performed individually, the GDP can only be used with at least three people. A similar example um, is our project Spoon Me, which is a double-ended spoon whittled out of sycamore foraged in Poplar, London. Spoon Me is a meditation on the doting activity of feeding. The double-ended utensil disrupts the idea of care as a one-sided relationship, posing questions about power structures at home. A symmetrical eating device can be seen as a manifesto for interdependence and equality in our most intimate settings and pursuits. Could you imagine a new dinner table where everyone eats together on a giant plate or drinks together with a long garland of glasses? It could result in lots of options of food and drinks shared equally by the entire family. Could washing up become a fun collective activity to do all together after dessert? Another thought experiment is this collage um, that we made to imagine how life might be lived differently if we shared our utilities, such as water or electricity. How might this change the way we do domestic labor? Would it become a more collective activity? And how might this alter our attitude towards cleaning? Would we start to see it as less of a chore, as more as an enjoyable and sociable activity? And maybe this would also have an impact on how we interact with our neighbors and each other in general. Um, at the building scale, a uh, disruption to gendered standards can be explained through the example of the housing complex Frauenwerkstatt in Vienna. The estate is formed by a series of interconnected buildings uh, around uh, shared courtyards and was specifically designed to prioritize community and shared space quality. Every single unit of the complex has a view on the courtyards allowing play space to be supervised communally. The interior of the flats is instead designed so that the kitchen itself becomes the heart of the home, placing the housework at the center of the house, but their layouts are flexible to different kinds of families. The design, whilst proving, providing an efficient way of living, it is also emancipatory, emancipatory when the boundaries within the home and in the exterior are challenged, are challenged and shared responsibilities are fostered. Um, the Comedares Popularis in Lima are referenced in Anna Pajana's work. In her research, she shows how domestic transformations can have agency at this scale. So reform in Peru throughout the 70s caused economic and labor instability to grow. And by 1975, the country was an economic crisis. This instability gave rise to collective cooking in markets where leftovers were cooked by volunteers to supply food to those suffering from recession. This collective form of cooking was brought outside the private realm of the home by a group of women who wanted to support communities and a need in their neighborhood. Groups of 15 to 20 women would gather in one of their homes and cook together taking in turns of three to feed their families and the rest of the community. Private kitchens became a public network, united in supporting striking and laid off workers and the families affected by loss of income. Although these urban kitchens are mostly located in private homes, they are open to the public serving lunch at a reduced price. By transforming the kitchen from a private domestic space to a political project, in the public domain. The reliance on of the workers' resistance upon domestic labor was made visible. Peruvian women uh, who were once excluded from the political realms through the confines of their domestic responsibilities shared political agency with the city's workers they were supporting and united with. The social and political visibility these women gained is maintained through the infrastructure of public domestic kitchens and many other initiatives to support women's rights have been born from it. The private to public transformation of the kitchen in this movement has emancipated women from individual in domestic labor through collective action. So we have described the accumulation of gender differences through a series of key historical changes. 
through shifts in power and politics, for example, the Industrial Revolution and the World Wars. The environments created in a gender-biased society end up negatively affecting people of all genders, especially if we look at spheres historically dominated by women, such as parenting or care work, falling to other marginalized groups. As we try to adopt a new architecture through adapting to climate emergency and post-pandemic life, is this a useful time to not assume our current condition, but to propose new ways of living together? We argue that we need to stop designing for growth and start designing for care. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the lecture. I would like um, to invite everyone to, uh, if you have uh, some questions or write, or you can raise your hand and we will somehow uh, manage to, um, to reproduce it if I can. And maybe I will, I will start with mine. Uh, so uh, what occurred to me is um, like a question that I have had for years and I have been asking my friends and people I meet all around, like I, I used to do it like two years ago or so. And it is the question, what is work for you? Because from what I from what I noticed in your lecture, you uh, talked a lot about domestic work, about unpaid work, about care work, and maybe it's different type of work that we are referring to as like work work, you know, mm -hmm. and also like the relation uh, between like what we consider or how we measure our, let's say, I don't know, success or how we uh, measure something we are aiming for, which uh, which connects uh, only to the work work, uh, which is measured by gross domestic product and uh, the other forms of work uh, are not included. So uh, let me ask you a question. What is work for you personally? Oh, I think that's actually a question we've also been asking ourselves and a lot of people recently, uh, maybe more on a kind of personal, more work work related side. But in terms of kind of, domestic work and reproductive work, um, I think we probably agree roughly that anything that you kind of need to sustain everyday running of society should be deemed work in a sense. So um, something like making sure that the house is clean so that you can continue to go to work or continue going to school and then it's ready for you to when you come back home um, is clearly work. So it's something that um, kind of needs to tick along for everything to keep running smoothly, even in the productive side of things. Um, and I, I, we definitely don't agree with the idea of using GDP as the only um, measure for growth. I mean, even outside of the split between domestic labor and kind of productive labor, there are many issues um, such as the way that it works with uh, various forms of work across the globe. Um, yeah, I guess everything is a little bit of work, <laughs> but yeah. maybe also the question is, um, like, is there a way of changing what work means um, and making it not necessarily tedious? Um, things can be work, but be enjoyed. And if we can kind of take the, the more obvious type of work and get rid of that a little bit <laughs> and then do a little bit more of the other stuff, but in a more shared way, maybe we can get better balance somehow yeah yeah i i agree that it's a really important question and i think we should keep uh, asking ourselves that question and i mean the most obvious example which is um really related to your um exhibition is uh when people don't consider parenting uh work and i think if you ask any parent they will tell you it is very hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, even the language we use, we say um, stay at home mom or stay at home dad or um, mm -hmm. sometimes being on maternal leave is considered, you know, like uh, people <laughs> you know, like a holiday. Yes. And um, well, I, I don't think it is. Um, so that's one of the examples, but also nowadays, um, when we are so connected and everyone works from home and work, it, it can sometimes seem like work creeps up to every aspect of 
of our lives, it is also worth asking ourselves, um, what is what is work? Yeah, maybe I will uh, add a disclaimer that um, that uh, everyone that I asked, um, and it was like tens of people, uh, had different answer. No one was the same. Maybe like something they referred to, but not not all of them, or not majority. It was the the, the economical aspect. But it was somehow in the background, and then like the definition itself, it was every time different. So maybe I will, I would, um, yeah, uh, ask everyone to uh, to <laughs> ask the question for themselves because I think it's really interesting and it can shift our thinking about it. And also like the language that we use, that we would refer to care work as work and domestic work as work and like real work it can change things and not to refer, like in Czech, we have the maternity leave, it's materská dovolená, which means like maternity vacation, you know, <laughs> or, yeah, or parenting a leave to be like correct. Yeah, so yeah, thank you on this one. If we don't have uh, any questions from the audience, uh, maybe I will, I will follow, I will have written something. Like um, I also, and we were writing about this in the email conversation before when we were preparing this uh, lecture. But uh, what I loved that uh, you were referring to uh, maybe shifting from the goal of uh, like this uh, um, eternal growth or eternal production towards the focus of, um, of care itself. And maybe I know that you are you are referring to this in your design projects, but if you have some other ideas how to how it can uh, actually be um, uh, designed or how it can appear in the physical space, like this shift more towards the, the caring aspect. If you have some examples or your ideas or something, maybe you you wanna keep working on. Mm. Um, I guess if, if kind of if growth kind of translates kind of maybe a little bit too simply, but um, you can kind of translate it onto efficiency and how we design for efficiency in general. And then I think that architectural repercussions of that are quite extreme. So as um, I mean, homes as well as many other spaces are kind of designed to be as small as they possibly can while still fitting in everything that you need to kind of function um, as a, a house or an office or a street. Um, so a kind of an obvious way would be just maybe putting a little bit of extra space in there so you can kind of do some of those things that you aren't only doing because you really need to do them. Um, so in the kind of Lacton Vassal are kind of famous for always adding a kind of a bit of space that's unprogrammed and it's there for kind of the extra things you need to do and the things that you can kind of spontaneously um just enjoy doing i suppose <laughs> uh, which aren't necessarily um about being super efficient um but more about kind of the other aspects of life that there are many of <laughs> yeah so you're saying more to give a like freedom or to the space so you can have some i i i've always like uh been fascinated how in the um, in the floor plans you have the chart mm -hmm. where you have like the number of the room and the name of the room and how big it is and everything has their uh, like exact uh, field, you know? So yeah, yeah I, I would really uh, be enjoying the space where you have like no name and maybe like, um, yeah, no number, no measure. Yeah, Mariana, you have some thoughts on that? Um, yeah, it made me think of another example. Um... So we were recently looking a little bit at um, urban play spaces. Um, and in the lecture, I mentioned um, that this idea of zoning in the city um, resulted very often nowadays, at least in the UK, we've got playgrounds that are surrounded by a very high fence. Um, so children are effectively separated from uh, other parts of a public realm in the city because you know maybe the public realm is designed for people to get quickly from A to B um, and also a massive issue of cities uh, being designed for cars um, and I understand that the concern is that children maybe will be safer if the playground is surrounded by a fence but what does that say about our cities um, 
you know, why are cars more important than children and, and adults? And um, there's a really lovely project in uh, London uh, by Math Architecture Art. Um, mm -hmm. And it's a play street. Um, and it's this public realm that's um, designed with um, really interesting and intriguing street furniture and um, play infrastructure, but it's not very obvious. So kind of the design is very open-ended. So the, the structures can be used in different ways um, and they are meant for children and adults alike um, so that different people can really use this space. And it's a, it's a street that's um, not very efficient. It's designed for play. It's designed for you to be able to stop and, and take your time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's a lovely example. Yeah. I also, uh, when you were talking, I remembered in, um, in our survey in, for the exhibition, uh, we uh, came across this idea I was, I was introducing briefly in the, at the beginning. And it was the, the division of spaces, like this is for kids and parents only, like very like sufficiently and highly like technologically made of playgrounds or where it's um, like a lot about uh, kids safety, which is like amazing. But if I compare it to playgrounds uh, or play fields or play areas where kids used to play in the history, like different motives, you know, and everything was like, very um, yeah, not not this this design just for this precise uh, function. So maybe it's also about our ability to merge the spaces and merge the use of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, that's actually what the parents were uh, referring to when they said that they like uh, the quote was somehow something about. Um, that one, one mother wrote us that uh, she feels like an idiot when she's sitting in the playground looking at the kids because the, uh, the, the space doesn't, doesn't think about like the parents doing anything else but sitting and watching, you know? So it's also maybe about um, like the designing process for like more than this uh, precise activity. And also for us as users, to be more open to uh, maybe like invite other users. And if, like, if we are riding a bike or a car, if we are using the same street, you know, it's, uh, it's also then comes, comes the, the topic of power maybe uh, into, into question. So mm -hmm. that, that was just a, a brief a comment from, from uh, the exhibition. Yeah, yeah absolutely, I wholeheartedly agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, uh, so um, Math actually, who I, I was talking to, Liza Fior, um, who's uh, the director of Math, they echoed the exact same sentiment. So she said, uh, playgrounds are alienating for children, but also for the parents. Suddenly, mm -hmm. when, when you have a child, you are relegated to this separate, special public exactly. place. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, exactly. So we don't have any questions from the audience yet, please. Oh, now we have. So uh, shall I read it or you want to you wanna, uh, say it, Ariane? Um, yes, uh, yeah, I'm happy to. I'm also happy to um, just read it out or if you'd like to read it out. Um, you go ahead. I'll... Oh, my video is, hang on. This is asking for <laughs> the video to start. One second. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Hi. sorry. <laughs> Hi, um, I'll just read it out. So. Um, it's a bit rambly, apologies, um, but I guess um, as we begin to like reimagine these renewed um, models of space, within that obviously housing and many other forms of space that you've kind of talked about today, um, and how these things are, these spaces are governed and financed and maintained, the neighbourhoods that they exist in and the new modes and practices of work uh, that they require. Um, I guess there's a question uh, of how those things begin to change the definition of family, um, expanding the unit of the home and its pr provision of services from the unit of the nuclear family, which you guys have talked to today. Um, I wonder if the, the, the definition of family can begin to become wider, more agile and possibly more precarious. Um, less um, static, um, and I, I'm 
wondering if if you have an idea of what family can begin to look like and um possibly if forms of like new forms of like radical kinship might need spatial standards and um yeah i guess i'm talking from a building regulations kind of lens um but that sorry bit of a blurred answer uh, question hopefully that's ish no that's a, that's a great question um i think it's gonna have to be something that we solve through probably quite a lot of expect experimentation. I think um, some of our projects might seem like a bit ridiculous, um, but I think it's because they're kind of intended as kind of like thought experiments to provoke um, some of these ideas. Sorry, there's a cat making a load of noise in the background. Um, so for example, um, I guess it's a bit hard to imagine living with maybe 10 other people or 30 other people. Um, and I think both of those models would probably need extremely different um, kind of rules and rituals for that to work. And that's probably something that you'd have to work out as a group each time. I think almost kind of like radical bespokeness <laughs> could be an interesting way to start off. Um, so, I mean, this, this is maybe easier if there's, if it's set up as a co-op or something, but that obviously relies on there already being some financing in place. But often, um, if you're starting a co-op, then you're already kind of starting asking these questions at the beginning of how are you going to share this space? Uh, who's going to do the cleaning, things like that. Um, I think that, yeah, that could be a really good way of kind of um, imagining new forms of kinship. There's a project in Barcelona, what's it called? La Borda, I believe. Um, which is actually a really example, yeah. La Borda by La Col, which is in Barcelona. Um, and they're a co-op and they've kind of designed these small kind of base units of flats that can then kind of spread out depending on what they need and also kind of get a little bit smaller. And then they've got a kind of shared kitchen and a shared um, other kind of community rooms, which kind of allows there to be like one larger family of maybe 50 or so, but still kind of broken into some smaller groups, whether that's families or um, other relationships. Yeah, it's it's a super it's a super interesting question, I think. Um, and I really like your phrasing about radical kinship and new spatial standards. And I, I suppose, you know, we've kind of tried to critique the spatial standards and the sort of top-down approach mm -hmm. to spatial planning. So I get I guess we're kind of advocating for community effort and bottom-up. Um, initiatives and I, I have to admit I haven't even begun to think about alternative spatial standards because we've it feels like we've still got so much work to do before we um, get there but I, I, lo I love it as an idea to to think about you know what um, what are these new spatial standards um, based on if not the patriarchal family mm -hmm. and not the individualized living. I, I imagine these, these new spatial standards would kind of take into account people as individuals um, and also collective forms of living at the same time. In regards, if I can just add to the, the standards and regulations point, um, and not the kind of the, the bylaw house, for example, and other regulations that have happened so far, they kind of very much control the way that families work together. And that might have been their ambition, but they're kind of hidden under like regulations about ideas of morality and cleanliness and safety. So, so maybe there's a question of like, can we hijack another type of legislation that is kind of more easily like put into housing, whether that's um, thinking about fire regulations or other access related things and kind of add little moments in there that can slowly start to pick away at some of these um, issues. So for example, over here, it's very difficult to do anything interesting with the kitchen because the fire regulations kind of prevent you from having anything too open or without an escape route. So it kind of needs to be taken apart from several different types of regulation to be able to get anywhere as well. Maybe I will add to this, though, because uh, 
I've been thinking uh, simultaneously about this while you were uh, talking, and um, I will refer to uh, to a conversation we had uh, in the Erander accompanying program on Saturday, when where we went to public space in Prague, and then we are doing some activities, and uh, then after all, we were uh, reflecting upon them and upon our um, our feeling from from the walk and the activities we were doing. And um, we were talking about the use of public space itself. And then since we kind of, uh, it seems to me, are using the collectivity or collectiveness as, of how we in, interact with each other, it's also like the, the efficiency you were talking about in, in how, where we go, go from point A to point B and like, uh, there is no like um, like living in between them, and um, so maybe these these collective actions can happen on on a public field because uh, we kind of how how I refer to it or how I feel it is that we kind of are lost in how to use public space if we don't have it defined exactly, and uh, maybe it's it it can be a bottom up um, action. It doesn't need to be like this. Um, this precise and like coded question encrypted in like uh, legislation, but it can be something like total punk, and uh, it can have different uh, different uh, uh, forms that it can take. So that's only my comment on that. Yeah. And so I have a question uh, that I really wanted to ask from the beginning, and maybe uh, if there are no more questions, uh, we can uh simply had to the end but uh, um, maybe a little bit controversial question but you you as uh, you started with the feminist approach and with the gender bias and the question is how do you think that actually women can um change or influence the approach in designing if there is uh, such a differentiation possible in your thinking Like women architects, I mean, like how if if what is that women architects can bring uh, mm -hmm. that um, that maybe men couldn't have in the like throughout the history because it's very like throughout history there were only only men architects so I we mean, have now like only like hundred or so years mm -hmm. that the women can study architecture and perform. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting question, but. Um, I would, uh, personally, I would shy away from giving definitive answers. And it's uh, simply because, um, yes, we recognize gender differences, but um, I wouldn't be able to say what um, women would bring to architecture without running into the risk of kind of trying to define the idea of femininity too much. Mm -hmm. So I would say, uh, let's give women the floor and see what they come up with because the floor has been has belonged to men for such a long time. So it's a little bit boring by now. Um, <laughs> so I, I think they will bring um, some interesting perspectives, um, yeah. but I wouldn't want to try and define what, what it's going to look like. Yeah, yeah I put it a little bit like controversial on purpose, but <laughs> still like there has been like hundred year of like hundred year history of women mm -hmm. in architecture. So it's mm -hmm. been a while, you know, and I don't know if uh, you perceive it that they brought something like extra or not. Well, I think it's almost, uh, it's not necessarily only about who's designing it. It's about the culture surrounding it and the culture that means that we've only had however many women and then a bit more and now even more. So, I mean, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of women that working under a patriarchal system and working under like the same economic system as well would probably design similar to any men. It's not necessarily about the gender of the designer, but the the culture that we're trying to create around it. So um, I would argue that there's not that much difference, but of course there are the lived experiences of if women up until this point have more often um, been dealing with childcare and kind of moving around the city with a child or, or with a disability or whatever, that obviously has um, implications for what you see as issues. Um, so things like that need to be um, 
kind of represented in the designers. But and do you think it's somehow changing in the past years, or where do you see the trajectory? I'm, I'm optimistic. <laughs> How many um, more years in patriarchy? <laughs> well, oh, that, that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this I'm is. This is, um, it's, it's really great to be here and to be having this conversation. And I think we've been having more of these conversations, which is really encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, but just to go, uh, sort of go back to your question, I will try to answer it without evading it so much. Uh, so for example, we talked a lot about the domestic engineers uh, and the improvements in the design of homes. Um, so this uh, particular area of study was led by women and we are critical of this of this legacy because as, as we said it's it's very much like how to be a more efficient housewife mm -hmm. um, but it's it's not that simple it's it's uh, it's also an an amazing legacy of women who really looked at the work that women at the time did and um, they um, really made an incredible effort at uh, improving those environments and the design of some of these spaces was incredible. It, you know, some of the uh, images we showed of um, disabled homemakers, um, of um, you know, imp improving the mm. the domestic work environment. Um, so uh, Bar Barbara Penner, um, I think, writes about about this um, legacy in a really good way. And then um, practices such as uh, math which I already mentioned, uh, again, uh, a group with a very strong feminist ethos, ethos. Uh, but they don't just improve the lives of um, women, they kind of look through the feminist lens um, yeah. to improve the lives of um, everyone. Yeah. yeah. I guess we'll kind of go backwards and forwards a little bit. <laughs> and perhaps the, pro, like, the fact that we're criticizing these um, the like previous bits of work by feminist architects and artists shows that there's been some progress made um because you start to agree with it and then think harder about what was wrong with it um so yeah we're being so, overly optimistic <laughs> well the other day we were invited to be on the panel for uh, reclaim holloway which is a group campaigning for a women's building in london and um, so that that's uh, still a campaign and sort of the, um, they have to campaign and kind of fight for it. But the, the, the whole, uh, the fact that this conversation is, is being had at a sort of municipal level mm -hmm. um, is, is another indication that uh, those things are needed and that the- And heard. Yeah, and yeah. the perspective of women is needed. Yeah. Well, perfect. I think uh, we just came to, to the end of our uh, today's evening uh, lecture and debate. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, let me just uh, do a quick reminder. If you happen to be in London, there is an exhibition by Edit Collective uh, in until uh, 23rd Decer December uh, 2021 in Barbican Center. If you happen to be in Prague, there is another mm -hmm. exhibition. <laughs> by our collective, uh, which doesn't have a name, we just uh, randomly, or not randomly, it's a group of friends and co uh, co-workers. Uh, it's uh, called Truth or Care. And it's in Viper Gallery in uh, Prague City Center in, until uh, July 10th. And yeah, I think uh, it was a wonderful evening. Thank you, thank you very much for attending this discussion and hopefully see you some other time soon. Yeah, I will clap with this reaction. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It was wonderful to be with you virtually. Yeah. S such a pleasure. And um, I wish I wish we could visit the exhibition in Prague. Yeah, I will I will send you this. Uh, we have a brochure. So from there we have a like a game you can play. I think I sent you. Oh so, yes. Yeah. I can send you my like good old post. You know? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye.